Well, a 20-year-old Ohio man charged with plotting to blow up the U.S. Capitol building was a, quote, peace-loving mama's boy, according to his father. Christopher Lee Cornell is from just outside Cincinnati, Ohio. According to federal authorities, he was plotting to attack the Capitol with pipe bombs and to shoot government officials as they ran from the building. His arrest came after he posted on Twitter his support for Muslim terrorists and then showed his plans to an FBI informant who contacted him, according to court documents. At the end of August, Cornell had allegedly written the informant an instant message saying the two of them should carry out a lone wolf attack as a way of supporting ISIS. He didn't think ISIS or Al-Qaeda would give them an official sign-off, but he felt he didn't need it. Cornell's father has told various media outlets, including CNN and CBS News, that his son was definitely set up. Chris has never been out of Cincinnati. I believe he was coerced into a lot of this stuff. Uh, I believe that, that, that this so-called snitch filled his head with a lot of stuff. So is Cornell's father correct? Is it possible that his son was set up by that FBI informant? Cornell purchased two AR-15s and 600 rounds of ammo before he was arrested in the parking lot of a gun store in Cincinnati. His father says that his son worked seasonal minimum wage jobs and had saved about $1,200. The guns and ammo purchased closer to $1,800. There are a lot of questions about this story, including how the informant found Cornell in the first place. Who actually posed the idea of the attack? Did Cornell, on his own, have the means or even the opportunity to carry out this kind of attack? All of these questions important because the FBI has made these kinds of arrests over 500 times since 9-11. What we almost never hear, however, is how these arrests are made and the role of that so-called informant. Take, for instance, the case of eight anarchists who had plotted to blow up a bridge in Cuyahoga County National Park near Cleveland. When the case got to court, it was revealed that the one person in the group who led the brainstorming of targets, showed them bridges to case out, pushed them to buy C4 military-grade explosives, provided the contact for weapons, gave them money for explosives, and demanded they develop a plan because he said, quote, we are on the hook for the weapons, was the FBI informant. In 2004, there was the case of Shahawar Siraj, who was charged with trying to blow up a subway station in New York City. Siraj's attorneys say that he was set up because Siraj had no explosives, he had no timetable for any attack, and he had little understanding about explosives. It was the informant who had pushed for the attack. Not only that, but Siraj had even said that he needed to talk to his mother before he would be able to do anything, and that's when the FBI stepped in. And then there's this case, the Newburgh Four, four black Muslim men sentenced for plotting to blow up a Bronx synagogue using car bombs and plotting to fire a Stinger missile at U.S. military planes. In this case, these men were offered up to $250,000 by the informant to help with the bombing, as well as free vacations to Puerto Rico and expensive cars. The judge in this case, after giving three of the four 25-year sentences, was clear, stating that, quote, nothing that any of these men did was the product of any independent motivation on their parts. The judge went on to say it is beyond question that government created the crime here, end quote. Well, interestingly, this latest plot out of Cincinnati comes right on the heels of the France terror attacks and concerns about ISIS. The group in Ohio, which was connected to Occupy Cleveland, that was thwarted in the spring of 2012, right around the height of the Occupy movement. I was joined earlier by Daniel McAdams, executive director with the Ron Paul Institute, and I first asked him if there is a timing issue with these kinds of foiled plots. Well, I think there is. I think you have public attention, uh, you know, on these events, and the public gets very excited. You know, the, the issue with these, these foiled plots is there's just an incentive all around for to have a big blow up you know of course the media loves it they have the most sensational headlines possible the fbi loves it because they get credit for actually doing something against terrorism the informants who are involved love it because they usually get some time off prison and the government loves it because it allows them to uh, to pass more restrictive laws and more surveillance laws against americans to keep us safe so I think the timing is very important because you have to do it at a time where people are paying attention and people are frightened 
uh, of, of these things. An investigation back in 2012 by Mother Jones and the investigative reporting program at the University of California, Berkeley, found that in 508 terror investigations since 9-11, nearly half involved an informant. The informants were in many cases paid as much as $100,000 per assignment and were working off criminal or immigration violations, which you just mentioned. Also, tips from informants led to 158 prosecutions. But of those 158, 49 of those plots were either led by an FBI operative who instantly Investigated terrorist action. The plots did not come from the suspects. They came from the FBI. So how troubling is the way that informants are paid or even themselves coerced into finding potential terrorists here? Well, Ben, you have to take a good look at our criminal justice system. Uh, you know, the way, the way crimes are prosecuted, if you're arrested for one thing, you may end up with 10 different charges on you for committing one act, and they may add up to 20 or 30 years in prison. So you'll find some guy who was a low-level drug dealer, uh, who maybe they say was a resisting arrest or what have you, they pile the charges on, he's facing 30 years, and they offer him an incentive uh, and training, here's how, you, here's how you do this, here's how you infiltrate a mosque, here's how you get this uh, some poor loser with no money, and uh, if you get him to sign on to this plot, then uh, you'll get some time off or all your time off or you'll get some money like you pointed out. You know, Glenn Greenwald did a great piece um, a few days ago uh, where he pointed out this fellow, uh, James Cromiti, who I think was a 45-year-old guy, extremely poor, and they had one of these informants that, were, that dogged him for eight months. The guy kept refusing to, to participate, kept refusing. For eight months, this guy was on him. He finally offered him $250,000, which can you imagine if you're some absolutely impoverished guy, this seems like uh, a dream come true. And so he's you know, worn down by this relentless uh, attempt, and he relented. And as soon as that happens, you know, the, the law requires you to take one positive action toward uh, uh, committing a terrorist act, and that's when, they, that's when they zero in and arrest you. So all they need you to do is make that one positive action uh, and really the line between uh, uh, creating a terror plot and entrapment is now in the United States so fine I don't think anyone can see can see through it. Well, and, and while that's true, I think going back to that case of the Newburgh Four, which I think you're referring to here as well, um, you know, this particular case is very interesting because in that case, the federal judge who looked at it in the first place said that the FBI was responsible, that they were the ones who crea created the plot. When the appeal happened in this process, these four guys, their lawyers are saying, look, it's clearly entrapment. The judge, you know that this is the case, and the judge looked at it, and there's a lot of indications that because it was a synagogue that was being targeted, the judge was afraid to, um, you know, essentially say that the FBI had, had entrapped them. But on this issue of entrapment, let's talk about that, because the legal definition means an informant can, can choose the location, the informant can provide the bombs, the guns, the plan, the date, the time, as long as the suspect intended on some level to commit a crime. As you said, takes one step forward, then they say, well, it's not entrapment. We found that bad apple that we were looking for. And in that 2003 uh, case, in particular of the, the Newburgh Four, um, you know, every encounter uh, between the authorities and these guys was recorded over time, except for key uh, interviews. And, and by the way, the uh, judge in this case simply said that what was being done here was immoral, it was unethical, but it was not illegal. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, we, we, ran, a, we ran an article on the Ron Paul Institute website uh, earlier this, or actually uh, a couple of years ago, uh, about the New York City Police Department's monitoring and infiltrating of mosques. You know, what they do is they declare an entire mosque a terrorism enterprise, and so that gives them the legal authority to go in and not just monitor, but to develop uh, people, to develop suspects, you know, and they have different ways of profiling people. They look for the most radical and outspoken. They have this whole sort of psychological profile. So they have, uh, it was actually exposed that they've had a years-long uh, project of infiltrating mosques in New York City through the New York Police Department and identifying some of these people. So it's, as you say, it's an active, they're actively searching for people who they can turn into terrorists.
Well, and as you pointed out in the other case as well, when you're offering someone $250,000 to commit a crime, a new BMW, uh, paid vacations and holidays, they're, they're, if you can offer enough people enough stuff, you can find someone who will agree to commit a violent act. But does that mean that the FBI is then thwarting attacks or are they creating the plot in the first place only in, in order to break it up? I'll give you the last word here, about 20 seconds left. Well, what's sad is in the case of the of the fellows in Florida several years ago, it was simply a pair of tennis shoes that got them to do this. So it's, it's actually quite sad. The other thing that's very interesting, I think, is that what the FBI uses to get these, uh, a lot of them are, are Muslim converts, to get them worked up and motivated to do these things is they tell them about U.S. foreign policy and what the U.S. is doing overseas. So that's sort of an implicit admission uh, that they are not killing us because we're free or attacking us because we're free. They're attacking us because they're worked up over U.S. foreign policy. And in this case, the U.S. government admits it and uses it to their advantage. Uses their own actions in order to inflame people who they then arrest for being inflamed. Absolutely. Daniel McAdams, Executive Director with the Ron Paul Institute. Thanks so much for your insight. Thanks, Ben.